What's up, guys? I've got a story from Willis George Emerson, who's described as a Chicago newspaperman, lawyer, politician, and promoter. And a lot of people say that this is just completely a work of fiction, but he didn't write it as it was a as if it was a work of fiction. He said that this Olaf Janssen came to him at 95 years old and wanted to share his story with the world, but only after he was passed away, because as you'll hear, he goes on quite the adventure, and then when he was rescued at sea, the captain immediately locked him in chains, and then when he got to port, they locked him up for 28 years because he told the truth of his story, according to him. So they were locking him up as a madman. He was finally released around the age of 50, managed to get a little fishing business going, and then uh, moved to America eventually. Now, the first 45 pages of the book is the author comparing Olaf's story to other research he has done and finding correlations. And like I said, it's not written like it's a work of fiction whatsoever. If you guys want to read the whole thing, it's available on Internet Archives, but I'll kind of switch back and forth between co quoting and narrating. I'm going to start off with an example of Emerson, the author, vetting what Olaf has claimed in his story. The Old Norsemen also maintain that from the furthest points of land on the islands of Spitzenberg and Franz Josef land, flocks of geese may be seen annually flying still farther northward, just as the sailors and explorers record in their log books. No scientist has yet been audacious, audacious enough to attempt to explain, even to his own satisfaction, toward what lands these winged fowls are guided by their subtle instinct. However, Olaf Janssen has given us a most reasonable explanation, which you guys will hear when we get to that point. So, after a brief autobiography, then his story of his journey begins. He says, we put in at Hammerfest, 71 degrees and 40 minutes north latitude. For the first few days, we had an open sea and a favoring wind, and then we encountered much ice and many icebergs. A vessel larger than our little fishing sloop could not possibly have threaded its way among the labyrinth of icebergs or squeezed through the barely open channels. After many narrow escapes, a strong wind came up from the southwest, and my father said that we had better take advantage of it and try to reach Franz Josef land where the year before he had by accident found the ivory tusk that had brought him such a good price at Stockholm. Never before or since have I seen so many sea fowl. They were so numerous that they hid the rocks on the coastline and darkened the sky. For days we sailed along the coast of Franz Josef land until a favoring wind came up and enabled us to make the west coast. One could hardly believe it was the far Northland. Now, this is the place we're talking about here, guys. The Google Maps shows covered in ice. It's way up north. But the place was green with growing vegetation. And while the area did not compromise more than one or two acres, yet the air was warm and tranquil. It seemed to be at that point where the Gulf Stream's influence is most keenly felt. On the east coast, there had been numerous icebergs, yet here we were in open water. Still further to the westward, ice appeared like ranges of low hills. In front of us, and directly to the north, lay an open sea. My father was an ardent believer in Odin and Thor, and had frequently told me they were gods who came from far beyond, quote, the north wind. There was a tradition, my father explained, that still further northward was a land more beautiful than any that mortal man has ever known, and that it was inhabited by the, quote, chosen. My youthful imagination was fired over the zeal of my father, and I exclaimed, why not sell to this goodly land? The sky is fair and the wind favorable and the sea open. His father asked, son, are you willing to go with me and explore? go to the far beyond where man has ever ventured? And I answered affirmatively, very well, he replied. May the god Odin protect us. Just one of those things where you've got an opportunity that will never present itself again in life, and they took it. Within 36 hours, we were out of sight of the highest point on the coastline of San Franz Josef land. We seemed to be in a strong current running north by northeast. 
Far to the right and to the left of us were icebergs, but our little sloop bore down on narrows and passed through channels and out into open seas. On the third day, we came to an island. My father determined to land and explore for a day. This land was destitute of timber, but we found large accumulation of driftwood on the northern shore. Some of the trunks of trees were 40 feet long and 2 feet in diameter. Just a reminder, they're hundreds if not thousands of miles north of where any trees grow. Instead of the cold being intense as we had anticipated, it was really warmer and more pleasant than it had been in Hammerfest on the north coast of Norway. So they had been about three days without food and they finally break their fast and afterwards his father says he'll take the watch. Olaf goes to sleep and he wakes up and sees his father had fallen asleep and he yelled at his father just in time to clinch onto the side and not get thrown out by the waves. A fierce snowstorm was raging. The wind was directly astern, driving our little sloop at a terrible speed and was threatening every moment to capsize us. There was no time to lose. The sails had to be lowered immediately. Our boat was writhing in convulsions. A few icebergs we knew we were on either side of us, but fortunately the channel was open directly to the north. Then they entered a, quote, vaporish fog and... It just went black as night, and they were at the mercy of the sea for a while. This continued for more than three hours, and all the time we were being driven forward at fierce speed. Then suddenly, as if growing wary of its frantic exertions, the wind began to lessen its fury and by degrees to die down. At last, we were in a perfect calm. The fog mist had also disappeared, and before us lay an iceless channel, perhaps 10 or 15 miles wide, with a few icebergs far away at our right, and in an intermittent archipelago of similar ones to the left. I watched my father closely, remaining silent until he spoke. Without saying a word, he began working the pumps, which fortunately were not damaged, relieving the sloop of water, then put up the sloop sails as calmly as if casting a fishing net. On investigation, we found less than one-third of our provisions remained, and to our utter dismay, we discovered that the water casks had been swept overboard. Two of our water casks were in the main hold, but both were empty. We had a fair supply of food, but no fresh water. I realized at once the awfulness of our position. It is indeed bad, remarked my father. However, let us dry our clothes and trust to the god Odin. So they travel on a few days, and at one point he says, Reaching over the side rail, I filled a vessel with water for the purpose of washing my hands and face. To my astonishment, when the water came in contact with my lips, it was fresh. It could taste no salt. I told my father, he said, you're going mad. I said, taste it. And sure enough, there was fresh water. And a side note, I was reading recently that all of the glaciers are fresh water, so... How's all the fresh water getting together and forming these glaciers? But anyway, way far north, and they're sailing in fresh water now. Olaf and his father figure it's a blessing from Odin. So sailing on, we found the northern point of the compass pressing hard against the glass. And his father said, I've heard of this before, and it's what they call the dipping of the needle. They loosened the compass and turned it at right angles to the surface of the sea. It finally freed itself, shifted a little bit, and then finally pointed a course. They sail in a general northerly direction for 11 days, in which they drank one of the two casks of water, and then they went to refill it, refill it and it was now salt water again. He describes the tedium of this time out there, because if you think about it, you know, 11 days with on calm water, there's really nothing going on on a ship. And it's, it sounds like it was a couple days after that even, when finally, a little bit of action, they see a light on the horizon, and his father says, it's a mock sun. I've heard of these. Uh, it's called a reflection or mirage, and it will pass away soon. But this dull red false sun, as we supposed it to be, did not pass away for several hours. In the following days, it got to where they could see this false sun for 12 out of every 24 hours. Gradually, it seemed to climb higher in the horizon of an uncertain purple sky. If 
finally, after a few more days, the dipping of the needle had ceased, and he was wondering, what could this mean? Our many days of sailing had certainly carried us far past the North Pole, and yet the needle continued to point north. And finally, they see land. We sailed for three days along the shoreline, then came to the mouth of a ford or river of immense size. This proved to be a mighty river. We continued our journey for ten days thereafter, and we found we had attained a distance inland where the ocean tides no longer affected the water. This was fresh water, so they were able to refill their supplies, and then said, along the banks, great forests miles in extent could be seen stretching away on the shoreline. The trees were of enormous size. We anchored on a sandy beach and waded ashore and was rewarded by finding a quantity of nuts that were very palatable and satisfying. It was about the 1st of September, we calculated, over five months since our leaving. Suddenly, we were frightened almost out of our wits by hearing in the far distance the singing of people. Very soon after, we discovered a huge ship gliding down the river directly towards us. Those on boards were, were singing in one mighty chorus that echoing from bank to bank sounded like a thousand voices filling the whole universe with quivering melody. The accompaniment was played on string instruments not unlike our harps. It was a larger ship than we had ever seen and was constructed differently. The immense craft paused and almost immediately a boat was lowered and six men of gigantic stature rode to our little fishing sloop. They spoke to us in a strange language. We knew from their manner that they were not unfriendly. They talked a great deal amongst themselves, and one of them laughed as though finding us a strange discovery. One of them spied our compass, and it seemed to interest them more than any other part of our sloop. Finally, the leader motioned as if to ask whether we were willing to leave our craft and go on board of their ship. Olaf and his dad talk. They decide, well, okay, they're huge giants, but they're probably the crack regiment of the ship, and they seem friendly enough, so worst they can do is kill us. And it's probably better to go willingly than just have them take us by force. Within a few minutes, we were on board the ship, and a half hour later, our little fishing sloop had been lifted bodily out of the water by a strange sort of hook and tackle, and then set on board as if a curiosity. There were several hundred people on board this mammoth ship, which we discovered later was called the Nas, meaning pleasure or, more specifically, pleasure excursion ship. There was not a single man aboard who would not have measured fully 12 feet in height, as they all wore full beards, not particularly long, but seemingly short-cropped. They had mild and beautiful faces, exceedingly fair, with ruddy complexions. The hair and beard were some black, others sandy, and still others yellow. The captain was, as we designated the dignitary in command of the great vessel, was fully a head taller than any of his companions. The women averaged from 10 to 11 feet in height, and their features were especially rectangular and refined, while their complexion was, was of a most delicate tint heightened by a healthful glow. Both men and women seemed to possess that particular case of manner in which we deem a sign of good breeding, and, notwithstanding their huge statures, there was nothing about them that suggested awkwardness. Each one seemed to vie with the others in extending courtesies and showing kindness to us. The men were clothed in handsomely embroidered tunics of silk and satin and belted at the waist. They wore knee breeches and stockings of a fine texture while their feet were encased in sandals adorned with gold buckles. We early discovered that gold was one of the most common metals known and that it was used extensively in decoration. My father said to me, this is the fulfillment of the tradition told by my father and my father's father and still back many generations of our race. This is assuredly the land beyond the north wind. We were given into the charge of one of the men and his wife for the purpose of being educated in their language, and we on our part were eager to learn. At the captain's command, the vessel was swung cleverly about and began retracing its course up the river, 
The machinery, while noiseless, was very powerful. The banks and trees on either side seemed to rush by. The ship speed at the time surpassed that of any railroad train on which I have ever ridden, even here in America. We found a radiance, quote, within emanating from this dull red sun. It dispersed a great light, I should say, one greater than the light of two full moons. In 12 hours, this cloud of whiteness would pass out of sight as if eclipsed, and then 12 hours following corresponded with our night. We early learned that these strange people were worshippers of this great cloud of night. It was, quote, the smoky god. The ship was equipped with a mode of illumination, which I now presume was electricity, but neither my father nor myself were sufficiently skilled in mechanics to understand whence came the power to operate the ship or to maintain the soft, beautiful lights that we now use in the streets of our cities. It must be remembered that the time of which I write was autumn of 1829, and we on the outside of the earth knew nothing then, so to speak, of electricity. The ship on which we were sailing came to a stop two days after we had been taken on board. My father said as nearly as he could judge we were directly under Stockholm or London. The city we had reached was called Jehu, signifying a seaport town. The houses were large and beautifully constructed and quite uniform in appearance yet without sameness. The principal occupation of the people appeared to be agriculture, and the hillsides were covered with vineyards, while the valleys were devoted to growing grain. Just imagine what life would be like if we had all of our technology of today, but we had kept it simple and agrarian, and every little town and island to itself with agriculture around. If done right, you would have a culture of inventors and artists and musicians in a society whose main purpose in life is to enjoy life. But unfortunately, with the society we have, it would never work. The I think a big majority of people with nothing but time on their hands uh, would be up to no good. But if you had a society that took pride and dignity in living their life and their culture and everything around them, but that would take everyone having morals and self-discipline taught to them from a young age, and they make sure we grow up with Jerry Springer. But it sounds like a really good utopian-type society that he's describing here, where, yeah, they've got technology to fulfill their needs, and they've kept it real. <laughs> grow the wine, grow the food, and let's go for a boat ride for a few days, you know? Okay, Olaf says he's also never seen such a display of gold. The door casings were inlaid and the tables were veneered with sheetings of gold. Domes of the public buildings were of gold. And it was used most generously in the finishings of the great temples of music. The temples of music. See, that's a society with its head on straight. Vegetation grew in lavish exuberance and fruit of all kinds possessed the most delicate flavors. Clusters of grapes four and five feet in length, each grape as large in, as an orange, and apples larger than a man's head typically typified the wonderful growth of all the things on the inside of the earth. The great redwood trees of California would be considered mere underbrush compared with this giant forest of trees extending for miles and miles in all directions. In many directions along the foothills of the mountains, vast herds of cattle were seen during the last day of our travel on the river. We heard much of a city called Eden, but were kept in Jehu for an entire year. By the end of that time, we had learned to speak fairly well the language of this strange race. Now, I want to point out that he never uh, mentions this as being the Eden from the Bible. He did grow up with... Odin and Thor and Norse mythology, and he just mentions it casually like any other city, like Chicago, which is probably about the opposite of Eden these days. One day, an envoy from the ruler at Eden came to see us, and for two whole days, my father and myself were put through a series of surprising questions. 
They wish to know from whence we came, what sort of people dwelt, quote, without, what God we worshipped, our religious beliefs, the mode of living in our strange land, and a thousand other things. So he goes on and describes how his compass still pointed to the north and that they were, by all estimates, several hundred miles south of north, (laughs) the pole. And he talks about how they worship the, quote, smoky God. And he says he has since learned that their language was similar to Sanskrit. And we're already at 21 minutes here, and we're on page 117 of about 190. So I think I'm going to split this up into two videos if anybody wants to hear the rest of this. Spoiler alert, he does go to Eden on a monorail. (laughs) <laughs> and they go check out the countryside and the flora and the fauna, among other things. So if you're enjoying the story, come back for part two. Static out.